Um, before I read the scripture quick, I, I see we have guests, visitors today. Um, did you all want to introduce yourself? Or? Well, hi, uh, yeah, we're from family, and my wife and my daughter Libby. Yeah, we just moved from uh, Florida, 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 my my wife is back. Everybody said I looked better today. I, it's because my wife is back, so um, I figured that would make her feel better. <laughs> Except she's up all night and sleeps all day because the jet lag. Yeah, <laughs> probably is. There, there's something. Um, now this is this is off my script, but marriage is a model of Christ in the church, and for those of you who have been in the position I was where your spouse is gone for any period of time there's something that feels very dislocative you don't you, something's not right it, no matter how well you can run the shop while they're gone something in your life is missing and the image than that is that without Jesus in our life no matter how well we run our life how much we have how much we can do on our own there's something missing that we can never fill with all the things that we try to fill it with. Amen. So, with that, I'm going to talk about the most depressing topic I could think of. No, <laughs> sir. Um, this is the scripture for today is 1 John 1, 6 through 10. Um, and there's a little overlap from last time uh, because it's a little different idea I want to focus on today. But 1 John 1, 6 through 10. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not with us. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word today, I pray that we meet you as a God of love and mercy, who sent his Son to cover over our sins but also we would take seriously your holiness and that we would see you as a God who is also, in, in addition to being loving and merciful and gracious, a God who is holy. But has sent his son and given us the righteousness of Christ through his blood. Lord, open our eyes to see your glorious wonder today through your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, this is something I, I don't know. Wait, if I say just say the word sin, I want you to think for a minute what comes to your mind. And I want you to just think of that image and, and hold it there for a bit because I get to talk about the one topic that I probably don't like to talk about because it reminds me of my own scary issues every time I talk about it, and who I am deep down, apart from Jesus. So I think if, if you think of that image you had in your mind, it might be a part of it, it might be something that you try to, to keep yourself distracted with, like I'm not that guy or girl. Or it might be something that you don't even, you can't even imagine what it, what exactly is sin. Um, whoops. Now I'm going to kind of wander around a little bit today with this idea, maybe hopefully not more than usual, but I want to start out by affirming this idea. We, we call this scripture interprets scripture. So 
if there's an idea that we find in the Bible that is sort of ambiguous, the best place to look is not in our own brains or in some other book. The best place to look is in the Bible. So this idea of scripture interpreting scripture tells us that the Bible text is the best, best place to look to find out what something means if you're not sure. And this is this comes from the Reformation, like when the the early church decided, or not the early church, the medieval church decided that, hey, these Catholics are saying some weird things. And back then they were saying really weird things. They started looking at scripture and they started realizing that a lot of what was being said in the world was not what the Bible was teaching. So they came up with this thing of only scripture as, as where we find the truth about who we are. And this to me relates to sin particularly because if we try to understand sin in light of what I think or my neighbor thinks or even the world thinks, we're going to get very different ideas. Okay, so I'm going to start with what we call the problem of sin. And I could go through this in, in, a, in like a really bizarre, weird theological way and explain all these, these weird Greek words. Um, but I think sin is easiest to understand. Uh, I'm just going to read this. Sin is probably easiest to understand in light of its consequences. Okay, our relationship with God, with our fellow human, our neighbor has been broken. The world we live in is under a curse and all humanity has been condemned to death. We can do nothing to fix this in our own power. So, what what stands out in, in the, this problem of sin to me is the the variety of ways that the Bible addresses this idea of sin. Now, there, I've seen a ton of sermons that said. They, they look at this Greek word, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's harmartia, this is the Greek word. And they explain to you, oh, it, it means missing the mark. Um, and, and it's true that the, if you look at the word, the way it was originally used, it means missing the mark. But it, it also means, there's, there's several words in the Old Testament, several words in the New Testament that are used to deal with sin. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about this so we can get a better picture of what this sin that the scripture here is talking about, what it exactly encompasses. Because, I don't know, we, we seem to, in our culture today, in America in particular, we seem to have lost the sense of sin and even a bigger problem, we seem to have lost the sense of God's holiness and what that looks like. So I want to say that the, the four main concepts in the Old Testament when, when dealing with sin would first be very broad. It just means to be mistaken, to be found deficient or lacking, or to miss the mark. You fall short of the goal. Which is what Paul says in Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. Now, the other word they talk use to talk about sin is, it talks about more of a willful violation of some rule. Think of Adam and Eve when they're in the garden. And God said, you can eat up all the trees in the garden except this one. Don't touch it. <laughs> I didn't say don't touch it. Sorry. He said, don't eat from that tree or you'll die. And when tempted, the woman came and, and the Satan serpent said, whoa, did God really say you shouldn't eat? And she goes, oh, we can't eat it. We can't even touch it. Right. But what did they do? They willfully chose to disobey the rules. She saw that the fruit was good, looked good, and you know it, it gives knowledge. So she, that's that's what that concept would be. Um, it's almost always used. There's another word that's almost always used to indicate moral guilt. 
before God. Like you, these people are guilty of some kind of crime against God. Um, and more generally, it's just they use words for that refer to disobedience, rebellion, disloyalty, or a crime. And the, the one I'm going to talk about more later is underlying all of these is the idea that what we call sin is depicted primarily as an injury to God's holiness. And I'll talk more about that when I get to Isaiah. Now in the New Testament, I already mentioned the, the one, I promise the only Greek word I'm going to use is harmartia, which is the one that everybody will talk about, which means missing the mark. But there's other words that they use to refer to it, and sometimes it's called transgression. Sometimes it's called debt. Sometimes it's just called disobedience. It also means you, you lack faithfulness. Uh, there's like seven or more different words that they use in Greek. Um, but the point is, our notion of sin is either too narrow or it's just vanished from society. And in that, when I say it's too narrow, we tend to think of it as, I do a bad thing that maybe offends someone else, it hurts someone else, I stole something, I broke a law. But what we seem to miss is that sin primarily offends God's holiness. Now, what happened? Okay, so one thing that the Bible never denies about sin is that there is a human responsibility for it. And we, we heard the Garden of Eden story, Adam and Eve. This is kind of an interesting passage. This is when, when Cain and Abel are both sacrificing to God and, and Cain, is, his sacrifices aren't accepted for some reason. And instead of, you know, asking God, hey, what's wrong? Cause, or praying something, he gets angry. And God comes to him. Like, this is a, an interesting thing. The Lord approaches him in his anger and says, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do, do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Sin almost takes on a tangible, like, it has like a power in this thing. But Cain himself was responsible for his actions. God said, look, you need to exercise some self-control. I tell my, my kids this all the time. You're going to be faced with things that you really, really desire to do but aren't good for you. You need to have self-control. Now, how possible... The assumption here is, though, that in Cain's sake, the case, sake, case, in Cain's case, he eventually killed his brother. And, and this continues. It's not just Cain. It's, it's the first example. But it continues. And Paul, this is what Paul said about it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no exception. It doesn't say... Somebody else made me do it, right? That's what Adam tried to do. He tried to convince God that somehow his wife was responsible for his sin. His wife tried to, to, to blame the serpent. But we all are responsible for our own sin. And I think at some level we share a corporate responsibility. I think that the, the evil things in this world are perpetuated when... Good people just don't do or say anything. Um, and the wages, what we earn, I use this a lot when we, when we do outreach, it's the wages of sin is death. This is what we earn through our own action. And when we, what we do in this life, that's what we earn. And this is all apart from Jesus. So what was God's proclamation about humanity? This is 
I this is one of the it kind of these are scary passages to me. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of his thoughts of his heart were evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And the other one, it's it's a this is a well, I call this the there the fault there's a fault to sin and a fault to violence. Because I think that the the step that happened when Adam and Eve sinned they turned their back on God they turned their back on each other but it went further and this is God reaching out in love to Noah to spare him and his family he said I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them behold I will destroy that I will destroy them with the earth so what I when I say there's a fall to sin and a fall to violence, the sin, the evil, the propensity to e do evil things that God proclaimed first, leads to this ultimate act where you are committing violence against the people around you, even to the point where Cain killed his own brother, and his offspring were so proud of the fact. You know that that Cain killed his brother. That they would get to the point where there was Tubal Cain who bragged about killing people, like it was a good thing. Like somehow it expressed his power, or I don't know. But this is the progression of sin in this world. Okay, but we have God's initiative. God's initiative is to redeem us in spite of our sin, in spite of our fallenness, in spite of the fact that we have willfully rebelled against him and all we thought about was evil. We filled the world with violence. He promised he would never again curse the ground because of man, because of the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down every living creature as I have done while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. God's promised, in spite of our sin, to continually provide a general grace for all humanity that this world will keep going. Right? We're not going to all be destroyed <coughs> until everything... You know, like, we're, we're not going to all be destroyed by... Okay. <laughs> um, now this is where... I get into this thing where it, it, they're all all of the sins in, in the Old Testament. This understanding was is that all sin was at its heart an offense against God's holiness. And this has got to be one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And I've done I've preached uh, several different sermons about this, but it's my favorite. Uh, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe, robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the thre thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is Isaiah talking, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to think about this a little differently. It says, I am lost. Right? I think what he's getting, the word the way he says this I think some translate it as I'm undone and it comes from this idea where you know God said to Moses nobody can look at my glory and live but I'll you know pass by you and show you my backside um, Isaiah is seeing holy God and he is so overwhelmed by his own sense of unholiness that he's like, I'm uncreated. 
right? Like I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna dissolve into nothing when I'm standing in the presence of the three times holy God. Because how can we do, how could you do that? How can you stand in the presence of God? That This is his thought. No one can, because we're unrighteous people. But here's, God, here's, what, here's God's response. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Okay, this, this atonement, in Isaiah's case, is a sovereign act of God <coughs> that took place. And as far as I know, this is, this is a one-time event. God came up to this person and said, look, this is, your sin is atoned for. But you know what? I, what didn't happen? Isaiah didn't make a bunch of offerings. He didn't go through a bunch of acts trying to outweigh all his sin with all the good things he could do. This was a sovereign act of God to offer him forgiveness. Now, we have the same offer, right? Now, I said when, when I said before, when we meet God, we find a God who loves and forgives. Okay? So, based on the whole score, story of Scripture, we're not meeting God an angry, terrible ruler who just wants to kill everybody. We are meeting a God who meets us in love and wants to redeem him to us. Okay. And God calls specific individuals to be a blessing to others and to carry out the, his work to reconcile people to himself. Okay, he's think Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, the judges, King David, the prophets, the apostles, you know, Peter and Paul and those guys. Think you, because you are disciples. You are participating in God's initiative to reach out and share this good news about Jesus. Okay. Oops. So the, the flip side of this, this, the wages of sin are death in Romans, says, but the gift of God is eternal life. And it's eternal life through Jesus. In the same way that God sent the angel to touch Isaiah's lips with the, the, the burning coal, he sends his son to die and pay the penalty for your sin. So, what does this have to do with anything? Um, first, I, I want to talk about this pro progression that I think is, is going on here in John. And I think this progression relates really well to the way that, that sin can actually take hold in our life in a way that becomes completely self-destructive and not just self-destructive but tends to fall down into acts of violence okay so the first title i have is don't be a hypocrite why do i say that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness we lie <clears throat> And we do not practice the truth, but we walk. if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. Now, the way I wanted to think about this is, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious. If, if the life that we're living doesn't reflect the life that Jesus called us to, we, we might want to think about how we're living. Now, this, I think, is the first step, okay? This might begin with ignorance. Like, I don't, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily know what it means fully to live as a Christian the first time you accept Jesus and deciding to follow him, right? You don't understand. 
what that fully involves. But as you move on, as you grow in your relationship with Jesus, you start to see things in your life that maybe need to change, maybe you need to grow. And what happens? When you start lying is when you don't practice the truth that you know is the truth. And at the most basic level for John, that's about relationship. And so I want to say one of the clearest signs that you are not walking in the light is broken relationships. Particularly with Christians. So the contrast that's used here begins with this negative statement that if you say you have fellowship, but you walk in the darkness. So what's the lie? Okay, if this is the, the, the lie is that we claim to be in fellowship with Jesus, but we're really not. And the way that it's, it's showing up in our lives is that we can't have good relationships with other people around us. Now, I, I've got to put the caveat, the, the, there's, there's obvious exceptions, right? There's people that won't reconcile to you, no matter how hard you try. There's people that are, are toxic and horrible and just drag you down, right? That, 